Okay, welcome to the special edition enrichment webinar from the NASA Night Sky Network. This webinar, we welcome Andrea Jones from the International Observe the Moon Night team at NASA Goddard Space Flight Center, and Sandlin Buxner from the Planetary Science Institute in Tucson, Arizona, and our own Vivian White. To get us started, please welcome Andrea Jones. Andrea. Well, hello everyone. This is just so exciting. I have been watching in the chat box where all of you are from and wow, I am talking to you here from uh, Virginia, but whoa, people from all over the world. So this is very, very, very exciting. Um, and I will go ahead and start sharing my screen. And, and maybe if we could pause for a moment, I know that we have a little poll and I think that uh, Vivian's got a little poll that we'd like to find out a little bit more about everyone that's out there. So if you could vote in oh, this little yes, poll. Yes, please, by all means. We'll give it just a few more moments here. All right, let's see who's here. All right, can everybody see that? I assume. Yeah, we have a lot of amateur astronomers and solar system ambassadors. Welcome, everybody. All right, well represented, but great to see so many um, different educators and different connections to astronomy. So that's just fabulous and remarkable. And uh, I just really want to thank every one of you for coming out tonight and for your interest in International Observe the Moon Night. This is just Wonderful. It's my favorite time of year um, because I just love getting people excited to go out and look at the moon. So tonight we have a special treat for you. So I am the director of International Observe the Moon Night and I'm going to start off with a little bit of an overview of our program um, and some of the resources that we have. Then Vivian is going to take it over with um, some of the hands-on activities and some inspiration about lunar viewing that um, can just get us going. And then also, um, Sandlin Buxner leads our evaluation of the program. So she's going to talk to you about the importance of evaluation and how that helps us improve our program year after year and what you can do to get involved and to find out information for your own event that can help you keep going as well. Um, but I'm going to just jump right in here. So let's see here. How do I? Um, Oh, there we go. So we're going to talk about International Observe the Moon Night, but for those of you who I have not met, I thought I would introduce myself a little bit first. So again, my name is Andrea Jones, and I am a planetary geologist. So my background is in Venusian Venus um, and Martian Mars geology. Um, and then I, I really have a focus in impact cratering and the the rocky surfaces that um, make up a lot of our inner solar system worlds and then some of our exoplanets and other moons um, within our own solar system. So I'm really interested in surfaces and how they change over time. And I really love how things are similar throughout the solar system. Differences are really cool too, but I think the things that unite us um, excite me the most. And so for my job, I'm the planetary um, public engagement lead at NASA Goddard. So I try to keep up with with all of our planetary science missions as best I can and all of our research teams and our research programs. Um, and then I get to share the exciting results with folks like you. So it's a fabulous job. I get to do all kinds of things. These are just a few snapshots of what I do. Um, so in the middle on the top, um, I brought a group of journalism students out to Hawaii. Um, through a RISE program with many other people as well helping with this. Um, but we had the students learn about what science is and how to report on that. So they were out learning about planetary science um, in action and reporting on it to help prepare them in case they 
pursued careers as scientific journalists. Um, I also present around the world about um, different topics. Um, I go to different field sites um, to learn about them, like Death Valley in the bottom right. Um, we have an analog festival there every year celebrating the dark skies. And then I get to talk to people like in the top left um, at an Earth Day event because Earth Day happened to be inspired by a trip to the moon, at least in part. So that's something we like to celebrate. So just a little bit of a background um, to get me to NASA Goddard. All right, now more exciting than my background is International Observe the Moon Night, which you're all here to learn about. Um, so, or, or maybe to, to share about, because I hope many of you have hosted events before, and at any time, use the chat box to share some of your highlights from International Observe the Moon Night. Perhaps you sat out on a porch and uh, looked at the moon, or perhaps you had an event. Um, so please do at any time, let us know um, what you've done or what you'd like to know about this, and folks will be monitoring that throughout the whole presentation. Um, so this year, International Observe the Moon Night, a worldwide celebration of lunar and planetary science, celestial observation, and our personal and cultural connections to the moon. Um, we are celebrating 10 years, which is amazing to me. I can't believe it's been that long, um, but it's true. So around the world, we invite people one day to go out, look up, learn about the moon, and celebrate it in some way. And what I think is really exciting is that, you know, you can have a great big event at a science center that is huge and has hundreds or thousands of people and everyone's excited and learning all kinds of, of recent science and future science and all of that. But it's also an opportunity to, for people to just go out and look out from their backyards and see our nearest neighbor. And that is great too, and we encourage that as well. So this is a really flexible event, or it's intended to be. We want you to use the resources that you have available, as well as consider your own interests and your needs. If you're um, a librarian and you need to engage your community in some way, this is an opportunity to do that. Um, and doing it in a way that your audience um, will be interested in and meet their needs as well. So take it and make it your own. That is the whole purpose um, and do it with the moon involved in some way. And then feel free to use the moon as a stepping stone to other um, objects. So use it to talk about the moons of Jupiter, the moons of Saturn, the moons somewhere else in the, in the universe that interest you. Um, and then use that to think about long-term observation of our Earth, of the skies, of other places. Um, and we are happy to have you do it in any way, but if you want to have an event, um, we do want to make sure that we have resources for you to help you with that, and also an opportunity for you to connect with lunar enthusiasts around the world. Um, and one other comment here, and Vivian will talk about this more, but if you do want to have an event and you have one area of expertise, uh, feel free to partner with someone. Most of our hosts do partner. So if you're an amateur astronomy club and you lack a venue, you can maybe partner with a science center or a school or um, someone else who can host you at your event. Or if you are you know, another a librarian, for example, or a park ranger and you have a place to have an event but not necessarily the celestial expertise that you would like, feel free to contact an amateur astronomy club near you or a solar system ambassador. Many of you are here and I'm sure are able to reach out to those in your community to help them out. So we'd like everyone to get together to, um, to use the skills and resources that they have to share lunar science and exploration and art and science and culture um, with those in your community. All right, so moving along here, uh, maybe I should, I don't actually see the chat box while I'm talking. So um, if another presenter could be monitoring the chat box and just jump in um, if there's something we should stop and talk about, because I can see that people are talking and that's great. Um, so just let me know if there's something to discuss as a whole group. Um, so International Observe the Moon Night was inspired by events held at NASA Goddard and at NASA's Ames Research Center uh, in 2009 when the LRO spacecraft and the Lunar Crater Observing and Sensing Satellite launched to the moon in June of 2009. And we had events to celebrate their insertion into lunar orbit. Um, 
And those events were so popular and so many people were excited about the moon that we thought, let's have a national international, or sorry, let's have a national observe the moon night. But that didn't work out because immediately we had international partners who thought, hey, this sounds great. We'd like to get in on this. So we welcomed them with open arms and right away launched International Observe the Moon Night. And since 2010, we have had participation in all 50 US states, in 107 countries around the world, and we're nearing up on one and a half million lunar observers that have been registered with our program. We know actually that there have been many more. Um, some places don't have very good internet connections, and some of our hosts have said, oh yeah, I forgot to register that year. But we know that many people are involved and it's really exciting. And we're hoping, of course, to get even bigger as we move forward. So maybe you can't see this whole slide, but it says, how can you participate? So many of you probably already know this, um, in case you don't though, you can join in by hosting an event, an event that can range from a small family gathering, maybe some neighbors, to a huge event based on your interests and needs and resources available. Um, or you can look on our website, moon.nasa.gov observe and find an event near you and go look at the moon and learn about the moon with people nearby. Um, or you're welcome to register as a lunar observer and there you can just go out and look at the moon from anywhere in the world and add yourself to the map of lunar observers and unite with global uh, lunar enthusiasts. So those are three different ways. Um, I should also mention that you have the option of registering as a private event or a public event if you do have an event. And that will either put your address on the map with the times and the dates and the location and everything so that people can find you and come and join you if you'd like extra company. Or if you have a small family event or a Girl Scout or a Boy Scout troop or some other group that you'd like to stay self-contained, then just put it as a private event and then you're on the map and NASA knows that you're out there and the whole global community knows that you're out there, but no one can find you and, and join your event without um, you wanting them to do so. All right. So I also want to make sure that everyone here understands that when we say observe the moon, we have lots of ways to do that. So in the chat box, I would like you to share your favorite way to observe the moon. Um, that might be by looking up, but it could also be by some other interpretation. So perhaps you like touching the moon with a 3D model or listening to the moon. We have lots of moon songs or moon books um, you can listen to, or there are art um, galleries that have lunar art or poetry or all kinds of different stories. So if you have a favorite way, think about it, share it, um, and let us know what your favorite way is to do that. And I, I also mentioned this not only because it's fun, but because there are people with different abilities that might benefit more from one or another way and perhaps a whole um, selection of ways to observe the moon. So at NASA Goddard, we always try to have multiple pathways to observe the moon, which is great for those with different abilities and also in event of cloudy weather. <laughs> um, in 2019, in particular, you may have heard that there was a rather important anniversary that happened this summer, uh, the 50th, land, 50th anniversary of landing on the moon with people was a human triumph, certainly something for all humankind to celebrate. Um, and now we have just a fleet of international spacecraft going to the moon. So the Lunar Reconnaissance Orbiter, which I work with, has lots of company, which we are very excited about, um, past and, and near future as well. And then um, from NASA, we are looking forward to Artemis, which will be the next landing on the moon with humans. Um, we intend to go back in 2024 to the South Pole and we'll revisit this in a minute. Um, but this is not just a NASA project. This is a huge endeavor and it may start with NASA, but it has commercial partners all over and will certainly have international participation. So I really, really love that the world is returning to the moon and then from the moon going beyond that to Mars and to other rocky worlds beyond. Um, so in honor of the 50th anniversary of the moon landing and the near present exploration, I'm going to share this video with you and then we'll talk about it in a moment.
This is from five years ago, still relevant. Now we're zooming in on the Apollo 11 landing site on the moon. So you can see the different equipment that was left behind by the astronauts. And this is what we see with our spacecraft right now, the Lunar Reconnaissance Orbiter. And then we're gonna back up and pan around um, using the data from LRO to recreate the scene and what um, the astronauts saw to some degree um, from the lunar surface. And we have many different examples of this. This is just one of the ways that we can uh, revisit these sites. All right. Andrea, there was a question about is there a link for that video? Sorry, can you say that again, Vivian? Yeah, there was a question about is there a link for that video? Absolutely, yes, there is a link. All of these are available on NASA's Scientific Visualization Studio, but I would be happy to share my slides. Um, I think we'll just post them to moon.nasa.gov slash observe um, at the conclusion of this webinar or um, maybe tomorrow. And then all of my slides have links to all the resources in them and you're welcome to find them directly. So absolutely. Thanks. Yes, <clears throat> thank you for the question. Um, another, um, Thing that we do with our current exploration is we actually take pictures of the moon at different times of day. So this is really important because one, it's really awesome to watch the shadows of the flags left on the surface and of the different equipment left on the surface um, over time. But this is also really important because it leads to new interpretations of the sites. Back during the time of Apollo, we primarily had images at low sun angle, like this one where you can see craters and boulders and, and features like that, which are important if you don't want to land in a crater or on a boulder. Um, but now we can take them in different sun angles. So this is a higher sun angle where the colors stand out more. And that allows us to see different types of um, information about the surface. So over, um, I hope you can see different mountains here. This is the Apollo 17 landing site. This is the Taurus Littrovallis. And you might be able, I don't know, can you see my cursor? If you can, there is um, a bright patch here um, towards the left, uh, coming off the left mountain. And this was initially interpreted as um, an event triggered by the Tycho uh, impact event that made Tycho Crater. And since then, we have thought perhaps instead it's from a, um, a fault that's running through this area that might have triggered a landslide with movement along the fault. So this is an image that um, Jack Schmidt has come to NASA Goddard and sat down in the LRO Mission Operations Center and looked at this image and others like it to understand where he walked on the moon using data from our spacecraft, the images and the topography and the radiation environment and other, other information as well to better understand where he was and where we are still looking today for more information. And you also may be aware that we're going to open up some Apollo samples, some core samples that have been pristinely preserved or as much as possible for the past 50 years and essentially have an entire new moon mission by analyzing these pristine samples. We're gonna analyze two of them at Goddard, but there are other um, folks that are going to be analyzing them as well. And that will lead to new interpretations of places we've already been using information from our current explorers. And that's also going to pave the way for future explorers. And I think I'm taking a lot of time here, so I'm sorry about that. But I do want to also show you that as we're preparing to go back, you might have seen the top, the numbers, those are all Apollo 7, or sorry, Apollo landing sites. Here we're zooming in on the South Pole. This is where we intend to go next with people. This is a really fascinating area because of the illumination environment. Um, the moon is only tilted a, a small bit on its axis. And so there are places at the poles of the moon that have only been, um, 
exposed to light or may have not been exposed to light for millions or maybe even billions of years, which leads to a really interesting plasma environment day to day, but also is really exciting for um, the preservation of volatiles or things like water ice um, that may have been trapped there for very long periods of time and which we could learn more about um, to find out about the history of the moon and the earth moon system and also think about as a resource for astronauts or for rocket fuel for exploration of, of worlds beyond the moon. So this is another video that is available um, on the Scientific Visual Visualization Studio website and others. All right, so wrapping up here, this information and all kinds of program resources are available on moon.nasa.gov slash observe. We have lots of activities and resource packages and slideshows and slide decks that you can pull from. Um, the LRO team made a whole collection of resources for stadium events, for outdoor spaces, for use in parks and other places, um, and also a legacy presentation about Apollo that you are most welcome to draw from, take it, use it, make it your own, see whatever is useful to you. Um, and that's linked from our website. We have a moon map the, in the phase the moon will be on October 5th. Um, and you can have your event on this day or a weekend before or weekend after or anywhere in between. We know that that date doesn't work for everyone, although we do target that. Um, and then we have shareables, we have fillable event flyers and, and many more resources. And then also a way to connect with lunar enthusiasts worldwide um, in our Flickr gallery, in our social media platforms, um, and through Observe the Moon on multiple platforms. And that was lots of information, but I do wanna turn it over now to Vivian who will give you more information about activities that we have um, recommended for this year's International Observe the Moon Night. So thank you very much and I'll stop sharing and I'll be able to answer questions in the chat box, but thanks again. We actually ended up with a really interesting question in the Q&A, which I think applies. And Vivian may very well answer this in hers. We had Kristen asked, how would you experience touching or listening to the moon? Are there ways that we could make that accessible at our public event? So uh, I hope that you have a chance to uh, address that. Yes. So I'll start and maybe Vivian, you can jump on board with this. And I, I welcome everyone else to because I know the resource of all the people on here. So that's just so exciting. Um, but touching the moon, I really like um, 3D printed models, for example. I also love rocks. I'm a geologist, so I always have rocks at my event. I happen to work at NASA, so I always bring moon rocks with me. But if you don't happen to have moon rocks, you can have basalt, which are what the dark areas of the moon are largely made of. And this could be from Hawaii or Idaho or places where there's basaltic volcanism, a shield volcano of some sort, or buy it from the internet. They have it there too. Um, or, and, or you can have an anorthosite sample, which is largely what the highlands of the moon, the lighter areas are made of. And those are things people can actually touch and feel. Um, we also have braille books from NASA. That's getting a feel for lunar craters, which a colleague made um, that are amazing. But um, if you don't have access to those resources and have an audience that would be, uh, would benefit from that, I wonder if we can put a link up on our website to those or feel free to contact us at any time. We have a contact button on our website and you can send us your questions about that. For listening to the moon, um, one of my favorites is from the Scientific Visualization Studio. We have a video that was set to Claire de Lune and it's moonlight and it's watching the sun rise and set over the lunar surface set to a symphony that's just spectacular. And I think everyone should go there right now and ignore the rest of our presentation. Just kidding. No, it's really great. Um, but there are images like that. And also um, there's actually the crater instrument on LRO did a sonification experiment where they actually set their data to sound so you can hear what the radiation environment is like at the moon so um, galactic uh, cosmic rays sound like one thing solar energetic particles sound like something else and just the the energy of the the particle sets a, a sound and a speed and so you can hear that and there are other examples as well but any moon song or listening to a lunar book or those are some ways I could listen to it but I welcome other ideas too so great question thank you for that yeah, absolutely. Um, we'll put some links up. Uh, uh, I have a link that shares 
uh, quite a few of those tactile versions of the moon. So that's coming up next. Um, I wanted to show before I get started. Hi, I'm Vivian White. I work at the Astronomical Society of the Pacific and I help with the NASA Night Sky Network. And I wanted to show something and Dave was going to help me. Dave Prosper is on here too, hiding in the background, but he had, ah, there he is. <laughs> Hi, Dave. Will you mind showing that video that we had brought up? This is one of my favorites. I just wanted to start here because this one inspires me. If you've seen it before, um, it gives me goosebumps every time. So I hope that you also enjoy it, even if it's for the second time. If you've never seen it before, it's about three minutes long. So um, get ready to enjoy it. It'd be hopefully not too choppy. I think we got it looked here. One second. One night I was bored in my apartment and decided to take my telescope out to the sidewalk. The moon was out and I thought, why not? Within a few minutes, people started walking over and asking what this thing was. Hey, what is that, bro? It's a telescope. Oh. Do you want to check out the moon? Do you want to take a look at the moon? What is it? It's the moon. Supposed to You're supposed to look right here. Oh, indeed. Yeah. <laughs> That's where it all started, and it just sort of went from there. I'm looking at the moon. Hold on, okay. Hold on. Oh my god. Oh my god. <laughs> oh my god. Oh my god. I can't believe it. Oh, oh my god. Oh my god. No way. No way. That's the moon? No way. Yeah, way. <laughs> no. Well, you can see the craters. Yeah. yeah. That is so cool. Oh, yeah. Get closer. Get closer. Get closer. Get closer. Get closer. Get closer. Get What? 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 Look at the edge. I want to see more of it. No, no. <laughs> Holy. I've never seen this before. I've never seen this before like this, man. Wow. That is intense right there, boy. Woo! Bro, that look like that's right down the street, man. <laughs> man, what you got here? Man, that look like that's right down the street. Yeah, isn't that amazing? It's right. Is that an actual image of the moon? Is it like a live image? It's that right there. to see it up close and feel like you could almost reach out and touch it and that's what makes it real to us. That is incredible. I kind of felt like I just landed on the moon. <laughs> it makes you realize that we are all on a small little planet and we all have the same reaction to the universe we live in. Wow. I think there's something special about that, something unifying. It's a great reminder that we should look up more often. Thank you so much, Dave. Thanks, everybody. Yeah, we'll provide a link for the video too. Um, it's called A New View of the Moon. Uh, you can find it on Vimeo or YouTube. All right, let me share what I have. Excellent. That one gets me every time. I'm a little choked up already, but <laughs> I'm gonna make sure that you guys all have everything you need. So uh, I'm Vivian White, and many of you here are from the NASA Night Sky Network. At least half of you are amateur astronomers. And I just wanna introduce those of you who are not familiar with the Night Sky Network uh, to our organization and give you some idea about the things that we provide. So we have been working with International Observe the Moon Night I'm going to say at least eight of the last 10 years, maybe more. <laughs> um, and this, that video of what you just saw and um, the idea behind International Observe the Moon Night, this is what amateur astronomers do all the time. We have some of the most dedicated 
um, amateurs uh, around in the U.S., but also there are amateur astronomers around the world who do this just for that joy of getting the oh wows out of um, people who have never seen the moon. It is such an easy joy to give. Lots of people do this for Halloween um, as a treat instead of a uh, instead of giving out candy, a lot of people will bring their telescopes out. So if you haven't tried that, that's a real treat for people. Even the little kids really get into it. <laughs> um, the Night Sky Network is uh, based in the United States. We have 430 astronomy clubs across the US. And as much as we would love to have more international participation, we can't do that yet. But we do have a lot of stuff that people around the world can access. Um, so while you can't be a member club of the Night Sky Network, um, we do have plenty of hands-on activities that are freely available for everyone. Uh, there's also a nice sky planner that tells you what is up in the sky this today and this week and this month. It's included. There's also a, a monthly article that comes out. So if you want to put that article in your astronomy club um, newsletter or your library newsletter, um, that's a great way to do it. This is um, the Tucson Amateur Astronomy Association at the Pima County Library. There's a lot of work that amateurs do with librarians, if you can see that. All right. Um, and if you are not a member of an amateur astronomy club, first of all, you should become one because it's the best group of people you ever met. Some of the really kind, loving people. There are um, lots and lots of experts there, but there are also lots and lots of newbies. So if you just have an interest in amateur astronomy, I encourage you to connect with your club and go to some of their events. Um, if you want to partner with them on a more regular, um, uh, if you want to have an event, say, in your library or something like that, we really request and um, suggest that you plan ahead <laughs> for that because amateur astronomers are all volunteers. It's an amazing network of people, um, but, but most of us have day jobs. <laughs> and uh, so we request that you plan ahead and you can request um, an event from an amateur astronomy club right on the night sky network i'll put that link up again and you'll find it you'll see it there so the clubs we provide them not just with um uh, the like the night sky planner but also with tools and hands-on activities that in that they can have as these big toolkits so that they have lots of props to help talk about what they're going to see through the telescope or if it gets cloudy so um, all of those are available freely online. Anyone can download them, but we also give the actual physical materials to the clubs in the network. So one thing I did want to mention too, if you are in a library, because I saw there were a few librarians uh, joining, there is a really cool library telescope program, not part of the Night Sky Network yet, but hopefully soon. We will also be able to participate more in that. Um, but you should check out library telescope program where you can check out telescopes from your library. I encourage you to see what's out there. Uh, so one thing that I wanted to tell you a little bit about tonight are the outreach resources that we have around the moon because Andrea uh, and the International Observe the Moon Night crew, they are linking to these as great ways to inspire people when you are observing the moon and to give them a little bit of context about what they're seeing. So there on the left here, we've got a couple of um, handouts. One of them is the Sky Watcher's Guide to the Moon. So it shows you, even if it's not the night of the International Observe the Moon Night, things that you can see on the moon. Uh, then the one that's in front of that is, can you see the flag on the moon? So like Andrea was showing, uh, the LRO, Lunar Reconnaissance Orbiter, is the pictures at the bottom left above the Apollo 15. And that can actually resolve the shadows, definitely, and even some of the equipment left behind by astronauts when they went to the moon. But through our backyard telescopes, we will not be able to see the flag on the moon. So this kind of gives you a, a little bit of perspective on what you can see through with your eyes and then through binoculars and different kinds of telescopes. Let's see, the top right, we have the uh, moon phase cards, and these give you the evening moon phases from day three to day 11, I believe, um, all the way, all of the phases that you'll see in the evening sky. And on one side, it tells you the things that you will see that day. And on the other side, it gives you some information about one of the features on the moon. So on day nine, we talk about mountains. There's also craters and mare and, um, 
let's see, we've got the color of the moon, what color all the rocks are on the moon, and um, uh, rays that come from the biggest um, and newest of the craters. So it talks about all of those different things, including some history about the Apollo landings and the first humans on the moon. And then one other thing I wanted to share on the bottom right, uh, these are moon myths around the world, and these are different myths um, from cultures around the world talking about um, what people in different cultures and over time have seen on the moon. So this encourages you to take kind of a new view of the moon and do some storytelling around that. Then there's a page that allows your visitors at your event to draw what they see on the moon. And you will be amazed at how wonderful the children's imaginations are. Even the adults get into it. This one's been very popular for getting families to talk to each other through the generations. So often uh, a mom or a dad or an aunt or an uncle will say, oh, I remember your grandmother used to tell me this story about the moon. And it will spark a conversation that might not have happened otherwise. And I really love to watch that and um, watch people sharing their love of the moon and, and the history of their family love for the moon. Also, so those are some of the outreach resources that you can just print directly from the website and um, those are easy to do. The direct link is bit.ly slash nsnmoon right there in yellow, but you can also get to it from the International Observe the Moon Night website. So both of those are easy to do. Some of my other favorite activities and I can't see the chat, so I hope you're um, telling about how you do some of these, but spotting craters is a really great one. Now we don't hold International Observe the Moon Night on a full moon for a reason, because it's very hard, as you see in this top picture here, to see much detail in craters when the sun is shining directly on it. Um, however, when you look at the Terminator, this place here uh, between the dark side and the light side of the moon, you'll see you see so much more um, detail in the craters and uh, that's due to the shadows. So uh, we talk a little bit about that. We have a new write up about this because as Andrea was saying, the landings on the moon happened at a really low sun angle. So uh, it wasn't much above the horizon and that was so that you could identify if there was a big rock when you were landing or you could tell kind of the size of things a little bit better. Um, so for the for a very similar reason so you can see more detail on the moon and then someone i saw earlier posted about just having a polystyrene ball on a stick and this is so fabulous this bottom right hand picture here shows um you can hold up any ball you can hold an orange you can hold an egg you can hold up many different things if you are out during the day and you see the moon go find a ball and show someone why we have moon phases. It's such a simple aha moment. And then um, I like to take it a little bit further and say, so can you make a full moon? Can you make a crescent moon? Can you, you know, you know have them discover what makes the different phases of the moon? This one is really simple. You can certainly do it in a classroom and it's very effective, but I find that doing it during the day when there's a moon up outside is really a big aha for a lot of people. So I hope you also have tried that one, or if not, I really recommend it. You can um, see the moon during the day quite a bit. Uh, so this is a good time to try that. You have to have the sun out in order to make this work, but it's really effective. Hey, <laughs> I think um, Mr. Hunt was talking earlier about the Oklahoma City Astronomy Club. And this is, I just wanted to give some examples of some of the ways that the amateur astronomers are doing amazing. Uh, outreach for International Observe the Moon Night. This is the Oklahoma City Amateur Astronomy Club and they are projecting a picture of the moon on the ground and kids can walk on it and they get such a big kick out of this and it um, just takes a projector uh, and a little bit of darkness and they have done such a great job with this. It's a really popular one. I wanted to say you can do something big and exciting like that. You can also do something that's really small and wonderful and a little bit geeky. And I am all down for Lego, um, is one of my favorite things, because I have a kid. And, but there are a lot of people who have put together the Saturn V. You may know someone who has put together a rocket um, out of Lego, and you would, it's a great way to connect with them and get them to share their passion about what they love about putting these together, what they learned about it. You would be amazed to know all the things that they now know about the Saturn V rocket or about any of the landers. 
So it can be as simple as that, as having a little display up in your library or in um, your kid's school uh, to talk about what, about going to the moon, about how we get to the moon. Uh, there are many topics you can discuss, but feel free to geek out there. I really encourage that entirely. Uh, I just wanted to show a couple of things here. You can find all of those resources on moon.nasa.gov slash observe. The direct link for the NASA Night Sky Network that we were talking about is on the top right there in yellow. And a quick note to the Night Sky Network clubs that you don't have to double post your events uh, on the Night Sky Network and also on the International Observe the Moon Night. Any events that were posted to NSN, between, I believe it's September 18th. Oh, I miss, I messed up that date there. I'm sorry, I forgot to look at that. Uh, in the two weeks around the International Observe the Moon Night on October 5th, so I'll have to look at those dates. Um, any events that are posted to it, the Night Sky Network from on those dates that contains the word moon, so that's your key there, just add the word moon somewhere in the title and we'll add those directly to the calendar on moon.nasa.gov. So you don't have to do it twice. And like Andrea said, any private events will just say you are holding them, but they're uh, not an event that will be shared with the public. So I encourage you to post all of your events there. Um, and and we will make sure to get them posted in both places. I think that's all I've got now. And I, I didn't get to see any of the um, chats, it, comments in the chat. So if anyone saw anything that I can help with, or if you have any questions, I will look through these and either get back to you. Um, oh, somebody was talking about the footprint on the moon activity. I absolutely love that one as well. Um, so you can get them to make a, rub a black crayon on the bottom of a shoe and uh, put it on some copy paper. That was great. So um, thank you all so much. If you have any questions, you can always write us at um, nightskyinfo at astrosociety.org and we're happy to help out. Or you can find plenty of information on the Night Sky Network website. Thanks everybody. I'm gonna turn it over to the amazing Sandlin Buxner, Buxner, excuse me, that who is helping us and making it really, really easy to get feedback from visitors uh, for your International Observe the Moon Night. And this really helps NASA um, do make, um, show them what we're doing and also uh, help us improve what we're doing. So thanks, Sandlin. Hold on one sec. Oh, of course, now my two-year-old has decided to walk in. I apologize. Give me 30. Give me three seconds. That's great. Are there any? Let's see. We've got, oh, we have a lot of people who built Saturn V's. Um, let's see. Great. Vivian, while we're waiting for uh, Sandlin, uh, Catherine has a question. How would you classify an event that is not linked to a club, but is not private either, such as the sidewalk astronomy event? Uh, yes, yeah, so you can put those right if they're not, if you're not a part of the NASA Night Sky Network, you can put those directly on the International Observe the Moon Night event page. Um, and we'll have all of that here. Thanks for asking that. You're welcome to, you don't have to be a club to hold International Observe the Moon Night events. There are a lot of individuals who also hold them. Really, you can just bring out your, your um, binoculars and share them with people. And <laughs> that is an International Observe the Moon Night event. So um, make sure to, uh, register those if you are sharing it with others. Thanks. Awesome. Okay, I'm back. Um, so welcome everyone and good evening. Um, I'm Sandlin Buxner. I'm at the Planetary Science Institute in Tucson, Arizona, and I get to work with International Observe the Moon Night and so many hosts, and our job is to gather feedback. And so we think about why we gather feedback. One is to tell the story of all the amazing things that you do. Um, we are the ones who end up writing reports to stakeholders like NASA or newspapers or other types of events, um, clubs. But we also work directly with hosts to really understand what the impact of your event is or to learn more about the types of events you want to run or who the audience you want to reach. All those things are ways that we're helping use feedback 
to serve uh, lots of needs. And so specifically for International Observe the Moon Night, we have some goals. We want to know more about your event. So we're going to be asking you to share um, pictures and stories. And we do have a survey that we ask every year. And that helps us really paint a picture of the diversity of events so we can really, again, tell the story of our hosts. Um, we also work directly with hosts to provide um, ways to find out about your event for your own knowledge. So whether it's a survey or uh, sticker boards or voting, we want to help you know more about your own events and your own audiences. And so my email's here. It's all over the INOM website, the International Observe the Moon website, and it's all over um, different places so you'll be able to reach out to me. And I do have um, another person who works with me, Maya Bakerman, and you might see her email as well. So let me just tell you a little bit about the nitty gritty, because um, we're hoping to entice some of you to join us this year and to collect some data. And so the first thing that's important is we just want to talk about what our own goals are um, for International Observe the Moon Night. And maybe these align with your own goals. Uh, maybe they're in addition to your own goals about this wow factor, right, as we're watching the video. But the big level goals that we have for International Observe the Moon Night are to increase visitors' awareness about lunar science and exploration, to increase their interest in lunar science and exploration. We want to inspire more people to learn about NASA planetary science and about planetary planetary science in general, um, really using Earth's moon as an entry point to planetary science exploration. And then what's really, really important, and this is where all of you are so critical, is that we are also trying to provide connections to learn more about um, the moon and planetary science. And we consider these events just essential um, to doing all of that. The importance of feedback for us, obviously, for our own perspective, it is required for NASA for us to continue to be able to doing that, but really, we want to tell your story. And then we're going to ask you, and we ask each year, how do we better support hosts? So when you're all done, we're going to ask you, what could we have done better to support you in the future? And if you think of stuff right now, we've made a lot of changes to the website to support for hosts, all based on feedback we got last year. We also are trying to help support your partners. Um, and so all of uh, the schools, clubs, businesses, families that you are working with as well. What we're gonna talk a little bit today is the kinds of ways we're gathering um, some information and some ways uh, that you can participate with us. And so we're gonna talk a little bit about visitor surveys. These are the surveys that are done of the participants who come to your events or our events. We will have a host survey. When you're all done, tell us how it went and how we can do our things better. We do look at all the registration data. That's how we are able to say things like how many events and how many participants. I and mean, then we do look at social media and we're ramping that up this year. And so the visitor survey that we have preloaded, and so you can always use the one that's been preloaded, it's very short. It can be taken in 30 seconds or less. Um, it's eight preset questions, which I'll show you in a second. But what's really exciting is that you can adapt it to your own needs, right? So you can add stuff, and we'll talk about that. And it can be administered in so many different ways. So we have an online way, a survey monkey way. It can be done on paper, and we're happy to analyze that. You can use mobile devices, or you can turn these questions into like sticker boards and voting. And so we'll talk about that in a moment. Um, if you get the preloaded but also the one that is custom to you the first question is actually not applicable so if you are the tucson amateur astronomy club you get your very own link and nobody has to actually answer that and so it asks some really quick questions have they participated before if they know did they get to see the moon um did you learn anything about um observing uh did you get to learn anything about the moon are you more interested um, and then a little bit about the demographics. I'm gonna pause here for a second and make sure you guys can still hear me. Okay, great. Um, other questions, possible questions you want to add? People have added these, so I thought we'd share them and we are always happy to share any question, <coughs> excuse me, people have added, they're, they're not secret. Um, maybe you want to know if their expectations or if they had a good time. Might they want to come to another event? 
Um, you might have a list of activities. You want to know which of the ones did they and their family participate in. We've had people ask, what's your favorite thing about tonight? Um, and any events recommendations. And so these are um, questions we would be happy to not only add to your survey, but to help you analyze. So when I say that, we will analyze um, and, and talk to you about your results. All the questions people have added, how many times have you been here to our our site or um, with this club. You might want to know the zip code because you want to know how far they travel to be with you. And then what are the other types of things they're interested? Um, how do you hear about our event? You want to know how your marketing is doing? Um, did you learn anything new? So there are lots of different questions that might align with your own goals. Um, and we are more than happy, uh, again, to share those with you and then also to help you craft something that meets your needs. If you go down this journey with us, there's a lot of exciting stuff we want to share with you. So uh, once you give me a request, we're going to go ahead and make you a personalized link. So if you send me an email tonight, you'll probably have it in a day or two. That can be, uh, it's your own personal link for your own event. Um, you can do a paper copy. We'll make you a Word document that you can print if you want, or we'll help you make a sticker board. I'll show you an example in a second. Um, if you do complete it online, we'll go ahead and send you the report of your results uh, within a week or two by the 15th um, after your event, unless, of course, your event is after that. If you do paper, you, you can scan those and send them to us. We'll analyze them. Um, or if you do something really creative, um, and I'll show you these, other ways to assess, you could take a picture of it and send it to us. And so one of the ways we've had success uh, at our children's museum is we just have sticker boards and we give them stickers. And so really simple. Did you learn something new today? We have people uh, putting stickers. Did you have fun? We also do a lot of suggestion sheets. And again, if you just snap a picture of that and share it with us, um, we'll really help you think about that. To give you an idea about where you find all this stuff, uh, here's the main website with the registration materials that we've been talking about. The host survey, which is this middle one, that's the one that we're gonna ask you. So we'll send you an email, you don't have to bookmark that. That's what we're gonna do after your event. The one that, uh, if you wanna check out what the generic one looks like right now, you can click on that survey monkey link. I know it says 2018, we just kept the link the same. It's the exact correct link. And this would be the basis for starting your very own survey. And we would give you, again, your own link. But you can check it out, see how it works. Um, Again, if you do this journey with us and you decide you want to collect some data, um, you're going to get a copy of your personalized survey as well as feedback, so anything we collect. Um, we will make a one-on-one -on -one personalized opportunity for you to talk with our team about evaluation. And so it can go beyond International Observe the Moon Night. Um, if you would like uh, to talk about your club or your um, institution, we can really help situate it. And then the really exciting part um, is that you get to get access to a special LRO image before it's available to the public. So you get to have it first, um, which is always an exciting thing. I'm going to pause here right now and I'm going to check out the chat and uh, maybe Brian can help me too uh, to see if there's any questions. Okay. Yeah, we also do, thank you Dave, we also do have some evaluation tips uh, on our website uh, as well. Uh, this is Andrea. I just want to jump in um, and thank everyone <clears throat> who has been sending us evaluation information because Samlin um, certainly has been telling you lots about how you can um, let your your own um, people at your institution know how great your event was. We assume it will be wonderful. Um, but this also is what drives movement for the whole program. So we take your information and we use it to make the resources that we have available better and better suited to meet your needs. So we really definitely appreciate all the work that Sanlin and her team does to make sure that over the past 10 years, we've been getting better and better. And then we would love to keep getting better and better and better. And the input that you provide helps us do that. We have limited time and resources as everybody does. And this will really focus our attention where we should focus it the most. So thank you very much for that, Sanlin. Awesome. So I will do my final, my, my, my final plug. If you want to get that personalized um, survey or just want to chat about doing some of this uh, feedback, go ahead and just drop me an email. So B-U-X-N-E-R at PSI.edu. Tell me where you're from and uh, 
a little bit about you and anything you might want to talk about um, on your survey. And we'll go ahead and if it's simple, we'll just make it. But if you want to have a discussion or an email discussion, you don't even have to get on the phone with us. We're more than happy to work with you. Awesome. We so with that, I am all done. So. Yeah. We did have a question here in, in, um, in the chat about uh, the logo and whether I know that there's a lot of print resources and a lot of other things that they can access um, on the uh, International Observe the Moon Night website. So are there any resources that you can send out or is all print uh, on demand at their own site? All the resources that we have on there right now are digital resources. Um, thank you for your appreciation of the logo. Yeah, that, that has been evolving over time, but um, we just settled on the 10-year one for this year uh, today. So yeah, this is, this is all coming right along, but we will get that up on the website. I really do like it as well, and I also want stickers of it. Um, so I think that's a great idea, Brenda. Thank you for that. Of course, once you get it up on the website, if you get that up, then they could probably uh, lift that off and uh, add it and make their own stickers. If they yeah, for sure. I mean, normally, all of our um, resources are digital and then and do take them, print them yourself. Um, we do have limited quantities um, at different host sites. Um, so sometimes we can get some out. But yes, anyone who is able to do their own printing, it, we really appreciate that because we definitely don't have the capability to send it as many as we would like to. I know one person had uh, mentioned about, and I put a link in there to uh, uh, Moon Trek. Somebody asked about getting some enhanced uh, images of the moon and uh, with different um, instruments. And, and, and so yeah. that's a, actually a really, do you want to talk about Moon Trek just for a moment? Sure. Yeah, that's another great way to observe the moon. So images uh, from the Lunar Reconnaissance Orbiter camera and then many other types of data from different uh, lunar uh, spacecraft have been added to a program called Moon Trek. I think it's moontrek.nasa.gov. It's part of Solar System Trek. So if you're also interested in Mars or in Vesta or in Bennu, um, or, or either they all exist or they will exist. Um, so those are places that you can just download onto your computer or your phone and fly around. If you have um, 3D goggles or uh, glasses, you can actually see the moon or other objects in 3D. You can fly over, you can take videos, you can record um, your, your swish through, you know, wherever you want to go and then take your audience there with you. Um, so that you don't have to do it in real time. But those are really wonderful resources and I definitely encourage you to check that out. Um, and also, uh, if you're interested in, in more digital resources, we have collections like Moon as Art Collection on the Lunar Reconnaissance Orbiter website where we have different data sets and they're all just beautiful as well as scientifically interesting. And the LRO camera also has two exhibits that they've put on that are spectacular and also, again, really scientifically interesting. So it's sort of like posting Ansel Adams, I think, in your, your, your living room, um, but they're things that are, are revolutionizing our understanding of our nearest neighbor in space. So both really, really beautiful and helping us understand, you know, processes that out throughout the universe. So those are some other great places to go and I can put links up to those as well. And Dave already beat me to it, but I was going to mention that in Moontrek you can also generate files. So you can download to a 3D printer for those of you who want to have uh, give your visitors a little more tactile uh, experience and you have access to a 3D printer, you can generate your own files of any part of the moon that you want. Yes, thank you for, for mentioning that. That's great. That, that's really good. And someone also in the chat box had mentioned um, that this year, International Observe the Moon Night happens to align with World Space Week as well. Um, so that's another terrific campaign across the world um, from the United Nations celebrating, you know, space science. And so World Space Week is at the same time as International Observe the Moon Night this year. So you're welcome to have both an International Observe the Moon Night event 
and a World Space Week event. They can be the same event, but you can just show audiences on both websites, hey, I'm going to be looking at the moon or I'm going to be observing space. And um, if you want a public event, you can advertise on both sites so that more people can find you, or you can just, you know, let let more space enthusiasts around the world know that you're part of um, one or both of these campaigns. So thank you folks in the chat box who are remembering things that I forgot to mention. So that's excellent. And yeah, this is a good time too. You know, um, we almost had a, uh, another country, uh, a true international presence on the moon. Um, unfortunately, the uh, India's lander uh, apparently wasn't successful. So. Yeah. Ah, and Fall Astronomy Day. Excellent. So that's that's great. Yes, we know some people don't like having them on the same day. We can't always accommodate all of the exceptions, um, but since they are together, why not get people out for both? That's terrific. Thanks, Ron. All right. Well, we are at the top of the hour, and so we want to, I know that uh, at least one of you is on the East Coast, and it's getting late, and so, um, and I don't see any outstanding questions right now, and so I want to thank uh, both Salen and, and uh, uh, Andrea for joining us this evening. This has been absolutely wonderful. Vivian had to uh, uh, skedaddle a little bit ago, but uh, we saw out the rest of you here. So thank you so much, Andrea and Salen. Thank you all. And if you have any further questions, do get in touch with us. Otherwise, I hope you have clear skies wherever you are or another exciting way to observe the moon. Take care, everyone.